Hi, I'm Wade Hudson. And I'm Cheryl Willis Hudson. Welcome to Just Us and. This is a series of conversations with book creators and those who are responsible for getting books into the hands of readers. Today, we are chatting with our friend Edith Campbell. Edie is a reference instruction librarian at Indiana State University, where she advocates for users and works to remove barriers to information. How you doing, Edie? Welcome to uh, this interview. You began your career as a social studies teacher. What made you decide to pursue a career as a librarian? I'm glad you asked me librarian and not teacher because I, I really don't know why I became a teacher. Um, librarian, the opportunity opened up for me. Um, it was time for me to get out of the classroom. Um, I got an email, it was, it was labeled opportunity and it was, my district was paying for people to go back to school and get their certification to become school librarians. And to actually become a media specialist and um, being someone who loves books, who really enjoys working with young people, um, appreciates um, what literacy means and, and its importance, I decided to become a school librarian. So how long were you in the uh, classroom before you uh, made that decision? I was in the classroom, I think maybe 15 years. Wow, wow. But you know, most of us have an idea of what a librarian does or what a librarian is, is about. Uh, how would you describe your role then? How would you okay, um, so as a media specialist, I, um, boy, that, that job changed a lot because when I began, there were two media specialists and I had a clerk. By the time I left, I was the only person working in the library, so I was doing everything. Mm -hmm. um, I supervised student volunteers. I taught um, how to do research, how to use databases, um, beginnings of computer literacy to students, organize and maintain the library, did programming in the library. Um, when I changed to um, the university, um, many of those skills that I had developed in the school library, I was able to use those um, and build a career in the um, academic library. But what's really different working in academia is that um, your career is built around scholarship, teaching, and service. So I was already doing presentations. I had done just a little writing, but I had to do more writing, do more research. Um, service became, became a huge part of what I was doing. Um, so it really pushed me to grow in ways I had started to, to grow, but um, it, it really pushed me forward doing that. Um, I maintained um, the children's area in our library. It's called Teaching Materials Collection. It's a collection for pre-service educators. Um, I had um, collected for education for our College of Education as well. I work with faculty and students in the Bi College of Education and um, help them with their researching, with their using library materials to find information that they need. The impact of technology uh, uh, has a role to play in that. Can you just talk about that, that move from librarianship to media specialists? So when I became, when I moved to the library, that shift had already happened. People were already calling themselves media specialists. Um, when I moved to the university, the title changed to library. Um, you know, people say that librarianship is a dying field and it, in one sense it is, but it keeps re-energizing, recreating, redefining itself. So the transition from librarian, from librarian to media specialist, um, I believe had more to do with transitioning from an emphasis on literacy to information and, and realizing that we are keepers of information. Mm -hmm. um, and so we developed a whole um, curriculum around information literacy. Um, I, I believe that's what the difference was. Um, yeah. And, and, and how that information is delivered to, right? Presented? How it is accessed. Okay. okay. How it is organized. How it is, um, 
how it is shared with others, how it is presented with others. So those, those different um, aspects of information. So you do a whole lot, you wear a lot of different hats and uh, providing information, doing workshops, consulting, doing scholarship writing, uh, and you're also known as the diversity Jedi. Uh, can you tell us what that means and what that role is for you? How did that come about? Um, the title, I think Cynthia Lodick Smith actually developed that title, and it, it has to do with our um, emphasis on, on social justice, mm -hmm. on, um, uh, I think more, you know, the more you do this work, the more you, you move beyond things like um, um, inclusion and diversity and, and you know you really you really understand how um, imperialism has is, is dominating our entire culture not just children's books but in culture in general mm -hmm. and and we at diversity jet I work within children's literature and we try and um, bring about better representation for people of color for indigenous people for those with disabilities um, for people who are LGBTQIA as well um, we prefer own voices, own voices. We prefer that people are able to tell their own stories. Um, people who with no stories perish. And we do have stories to tell. And there are so many, many out there, talented writers who have incredible stories to tell who just don't have access. Um, we, we try and help reconnect readers with books that, um, that celebrate our stories and share our stories and share our work. So that's what Diversity Jet I do. And, and as a librarian, um, it also then moves into um, being, um, bringing that justice and that equity into how we access information and, and what is available and to whom it's available and, and making people realize that information is, is a power tool um, that, you know, well, who is this really meant for? Who's, whose voice is being left out here? So those sorts of things. Um, you know, my Jedi work is is in children's literature, but it definitely bleeds into my work as a librarian as well. Many publishers uh, use sensitivity readers, and uh, you are a sensitivity reader. Can you talk a little bit more about, about that work and what's involved? Um, well, sensitivity readers, from, from what I've heard from others' research, have been around for a good hundred years. Um, and I think that they've, they've had other titles in, in that time period, but they help ensure accuracy in what people are writing. Um, I, I think that it developed initially more nonfiction work to, um, to verify what, what was being presented in those texts. In those texts. But now, um, as a sensitivity reader, what we're doing essentially is um, looking at stories that people are writing from outside their own experience and trying to make sure the representation is accurate. Um, and it's, it's a lot of responsibility um, because, you know, we hear the term single story. There mm -hmm. is no single story for any group. Um, of course, my, my sensitivity reading is typically for African-American literature. Um, someone may come and, and ask me to read a historical novel. Um, well, African Americans um, in a particular region and in a particular time are not the same as African Americans who grew up where I grew up and when I grew up. So, you know, it's a huge responsibility to get that right and to understand not only the Black community of that time, but what the country was like at that time. So it's, it's trying to understand, try, trying, to, trying to help others understand um, what they're writing about. Um, it, and the more I do it, the more I realize that it's the work an editor should be doing. Ah, <laughs> ah okay, that's yeah. an interesting yeah. perspective. Yeah. Uh, because what you're describing as a librarian or as a media specialist or uh, even as a, a, a blogger includes so much about fact checking, about uh, cross reference, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. making sure that things are accurate. And we know that you also are really involved in uh, committee work 
uh, with the American Library Association. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to read hundreds and hundreds of, of books and compare them. Can you talk about your work as a reviewer or work on committees uh, and the work that you do with the American Library Association? Um, I think my, well, okay, so my most recent committee is um, the Cyber Committee. It's a nonfiction informational text committee, and it's a part of OSS, the American Library for Services to Children. Um, and Fry Bread was our winner this year. Um, and we plan to celebrate our winners. We're going to have, you know, ALA is virtual this year. We plan to have a virtual celebration for our winners. Um, it's good work, it's hard work. Um, not only because of all the books you have to find, but again, you know, it's um, the committees are majority white, um, but um, many of them are as aware as, and in some instances that, you know, they're even more aware of the injustices, the inequity, the, the misrepresentation in books. So it's, being able to address those things with people who may or may not be aware and it's it people appreciate it. I, i've been blessed i've been on committees where people appreciate knowing when an author really didn't get something right um that you know maybe this isn't a book we want to we want to consider for an award or um this this author really shines a light on this really well um, to, you know, to point out things that are, are good as well as things that might not be so well. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest challenge for me in being on a committee is I can't review books that the committee considers. Um, I'm one of few who do critical reviews. I think I'm one of few children, African American children's reviewers, um, bloggers who are, who are reviewing books right now. Um, so my voice is lost when I'm on a committee. So it's, do you do the public reviews or do you do the committee work so that our voices can be heard on the, in the committees? Both mm -hmm. of them are so much needed. So, so yeah. the books that the committee considers, how are they chosen? Um, ALA, I'm finding is really unique from other awards. Um, like with, with cyber, it was informational text. There are some guidelines on what is what is um, eligible for the award. So with cyber, the author and illustrator had to live in the United States, had to be qualify as informational text, which is something that you know can be con a conversation: is this informational or not? Because not all nonfiction is informational. Some fiction is informational. So you, you have your criteria, but with, with the ALA committees, you get books sent to you from the authors or from the publishers, mm -hmm. but we can go out looking for additional books. Okay. So we can, we can look at small presses. We can look for the books that the publishers aren't pushing that might be considered. Mm -hmm. it's, it's extra work, but, you know, there are other awards where you can only review the books that are sent to you and that exactly. you know, yeah. and, and these are very large prestigious awards but they can only consider what's being sent and people don't realize that that mm -hmm. you know, there are books that were never considered for that award you are an active blogger and i follow you on your blog and really appreciate the uh, perspective that you uh, provide can you share a little bit about your blog um Let's see, my blog's birthday is in June. I think it's like 13 or 14 years old. Oh. Um, yeah, it's been around a minute. Um, <laughs> and and I, I, I was still a librarian when I started. I wanted to learn a new technology, so I started blogging and have, have stuck with it. Um, currently on the blog, I have a series uh, celebrating Asian, and Pacific, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, I've asked people in the children's literature community to um, read from um, a, a book and record themselves. So those videos are up. And right now, as the month is ending, I thought that it would be best to hear from Asian Americans themselves. So um, Sarah Dallin Park 
had a conversation with some of her graduate students. Ellen Olson in an interview yesterday. Yes. Um, Laura Atkins, who is a white woman, mm -hmm. did a book, book about um, a Japanese American who was able to um, get an apology from the American government for, for the internment. Right, and right. Um, so she's doing an essay that will come up tomorrow. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there's still a couple more of those that will close out the month for me. So um, I, I really believe we are all in this together. Mm -hmm. I believe very strongly, of course, in, in equity and freedom for African Americans. But if um, gay people, lesbians, um, tri or trans people, if um, people with disabilities are still marginalized, we all are. We're all in this together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. E, as, as publishers and as book creators and as librarians, we are all trying to connect books with readers. As a librarian, what more can we do together as publishers and book creators and librarians uh, to achieve that goal? Any suggestions? Boy, you know, how you answer that now has to be really reconsidered in the age of COVID. Um, because our access to people has changed, our access to materials has changed. Um, we need real conversation on copyright and how we limit information. Um, there are books that my students need that you could get as an ebook, but you cannot interlibrary loan an ebook. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, we had. Um, uh, an emergency library go up online and you know it, it seemed really successful was putting a lot of books in people's hands they thought that they were being responsible and limiting the books limiting the access in some ways to the books but um they weren't they weren't careful with what they were doing so there's a lot of blowback to how books are provided online um to read a book on a video, you have to you have to limit how much of the book that you read. Um, you cannot read an entire picture book legally. You cannot read an entire picture book because you're you're breaking copyright. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that sort of access is something that we really need to reconsider. Um, how are we going to really make information available in an equitable manner, particularly in times like now? Um, you know, we've got people who don't have the internet access. We have people who um, libraries aren't providing materials right now. So how are we going to get information and books to people? And, and that's definitely a conversation that publishers, librarians need to have together. Well, you know, Edie, we're almost at the end of our interview. We're going to go into a lightning round. And what we want to do is ask you a couple of questions <laughs> and just give us the uh, first answer that uh, comes to mind. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. So what's your favorite book? Oh, I don't have a favorite book. Um, Cause I'm, I'm not that person who will read a book over and over. I, if you could see the, Cheryl, we've talked about this. <laughs> see the pile of unread books. I, I just, I don't go back to books. So I, I don't have a favorite. Okay. Well, who is your favorite author? My favorite author. Um, so I hate doing this. Um, <laughs> so I'm thinking of some of the people whose books I would buy I hear they've got something coming. I'm going to find it. Renee Watson. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, Jackie Woodson. Okay. Great. Mike Jung. Okay. Um, a couple favorites. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. What? Uh, who has influenced you the most in your life? First My first. children. Okay. My children have. They they keep me learning. Yeah. Uh, when you want to unwind, what type of music? do you listen to? Music's not going to do it for me. Really? What's going to do it? For me, How do you unwind? Well, if, if I wanted to listen to music, I would go for um, some R&B from the 80s or 90s. Okay. okay. Yeah. okay. So okay. how do you unwind, though? So Television. You... Television. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. What is there? Is there one thing that you would like to do that you haven't had an opportunity to do? make that quote for my grandbaby. 
Okay, <laughs> gotta get started, gotta get yes, started. Yes. And what advice would you give someone looking to become a librarian? Um, really understand what librarianship is and all the different types of librarians that are out there because not all of us work with the public and with books. Um, there in Sonoma, California, there's a wine librarian. Oh, oh wow, I'd like oh, that wow. one. <laughs> <laughs> she would. <laughs> Okay, Edie, can you tell us then uh, how um, our viewers can connect with you and the work that you do? Um, you can email me at crazyquiltedie, or yeah, crazyquilts at hotmail.com. I should know my own email address. It's um, crazyquilts <laughs> at hotmail.com. I'm on Twitter. I'm at crazyquilts. And I have a blog. I have a little blog, crazyquiltedie. Great. <laughs> One other question I do have for you, Edie, before we end. Um, what do you like most about your work? Um, you play a lot of different roles, but what do you like most about your work? That it makes a difference for others. Okay, great. We want to thank you for sharing this uh, time with us. This has been a wonderful, engaging interview. And we want to thank our viewers also for tuning in to another segment of Just Us And. Please join us next time when we will chat with book creators and those who get those books into the hands of readers. And remember, good, good books make, make a difference. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.